For nearly four decades, we have welcomed journalists to campus to give the McGill Lecture, adding a symposium in 2007, and in 2009, expanding the program yet again to include the McGill Medal. The medal honors a working journalist, or journalist in this case, whose career and work exemplifies journalistic courage. Our first medal was awarded Jerry Mitchell, a Mississippi journalist who endured death threats for bringing civil rights era killers to justice. In the years since, we have honored a reporting team that continued the work of a slain investigative journalist. Correspondents covering war-torn regions, including some who were jailed for their work. And last year, a photojournalist who worked primarily for the New York Times, whose images gave us a window into a number of history-making events. McGill Medal winners are chosen from nominations by fellow journalists, editors, journalism educators, and McGill Fellow alumni. Each nominee is researched by a current McGill Fellow who compiles a summary to support the nomination material, and the winner is selected by the class. The 2017 McGill Fellows class, many of whom are here today, is made up of Sarah Catherine Bowen, Kristen Bradshaw, Mary Carol Butterfield, Lindsay Conway, Emily Giambalvo, Zach Hansen, Noelle Lashley, Celine Martin, Nicole Sartain, Maureen Sheeran, Molly Simon, and Sammy Smith. Celine Martin researched our winning reporting duo and will present the medal on behalf of the classmates. Hello, thank you for being here today. Um, today we welcome a journalist whose work took the whispers of young women in Hollywood and united them to form a voice and rise up against one of the industry's most powerful figures. Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey's investigation into the many sexual harassment allegations against Harvey Weinstein sparked a con conversation that until recently had been covered up due to intimidation of witnesses, settlements, and alliances with members of the press. Cantor and Tui based their investigation on paper trails and candid on-the-record accounts from his victims, including memos documenting sexual harassment in Weinstein's company, and financial records and conversations with Weinstein himself and his lawyers. To conduct such an in-depth investigation, they had to be as courageous as the women they wrote about. This means they exposed themselves to the same intimidation and legal threats that his victims once faced for speaking up. At one point, Weinstein called Cantor and Tuhi, using his stature in the industry to threaten their investigation. He said he had ways of knowing who had cooperated with them, means to undermine the investigation, and great resources. The reporters developed a fear during the investigation, but not of Weinstein. Instead, they feared failing the women they wrote about and used the responsibility they felt to tell their stories as a driving force to push forward the conversation. Their work encouraged more women to go on the record and stand up against Weinstein and sexual harassment in the workplace. It is this work that earned both Cantor and Tui nominations for the 2018 McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage. The pair was nominated by our very own Dean Davis, who praised the reporters for their courage and determination, despite the many roadblocks they faced. Their work, Dean Davis said, changed the way society confronts these incredibly important issues. Their work embodies the McGill Awards and its commitment to recognizing courageous, transformative journalism. Please join me in welcoming one of this year's medalists, Jody Cantor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Celine. Wow. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Really, to all of the students here, to the faculty, to the dean, uh, to everybody at Grady College, Megan and I are so grateful, so honored, so humbled, so glad to be in Athens. <laughs> I know that there's a perception that New Yorkers are snobby, but the truth is we come to a place like this and we say, this is how normal people live. <laughs> um, so it's great to be here for at least 24 hours. Last week was the six month anniversary of the publication of our story. And we spent that day feeling the same way we felt every day since October 5th, absolutely staggered, just amazed and filled with gratitude and wonder and appreciation for what this story started and what it became. We feel especially amazed because we remember the very tentative beginnings of the investigation. We had almost no information. Megan was still on maternity leave. 
Harvey Weinstein had a public reputation as a humanitarian. Even getting the actress's phone numbers seemed like it would take a whole investigative process unto itself. Hollywood sources were telling us that we would never get the story and that even if we did, nothing would change. As for whatever Harvey Weinstein did or did not do with women, that was how Hollywood worked. That was how life worked, they said. And even if we managed to publish our story, they said that nobody would care. The fact that all of that is now under question is due to efforts that went very far beyond Megan and my own. And that's what I really wanna talk about today. Megan and I are really mindful and very moved and very humbled that this award is for journalistic courage. Thank you for seeing us in that light. But I wanna be clear about the fact that Megan and I are not exactly like some of your other recipients. We never took on a murderer. We never faced bullets. We never endured imprisonment. Harvey Weinstein is a formidable character who used some very scary, very underhanded methods with us. But ultimately, exactly as you said, the scariest thing we faced in the entire process was fear of failure. What I want this to mean today for all of you is that the kind of journalistic courage that was required of us on this story is totally available to you. Everyone who's here, every student can work on a story like the Harvey Weinstein story. You don't need to go abroad. You don't need a flak jacket. You don't need to cover a war. To write about somebody powerful, oops, who has abused that power. In that spirit, Megan and I would like to help you understand what gave us courage, where we got it, how we used it, and the fact that if you devote yourself to the truth and the craft of journalism, that courage will be yours as well. First of all, we got our courage from readers. If you subscribe to a newspaper, to a national newspaper like the Times or the Post or to a local newspaper here, what you're essentially saying to the journalists at that newspaper is, I have your back. I have your back. Go do the hard investigations. Do it even if it takes time. We know it's expensive. Take on Republicans. Take on Democrats. Do it without fear or favor. If you knock on, somebody else, on somebody's door asking them to talk, and if they slam that door in your face, don't worry. I'm going to pay for you to go back the next day and knock on somebody else's door and try again. We drew immense courage from our bosses and editors. Arthur Salzberger, Dean Bacay, Matt Purdy, Rebecca Corbett took every ounce of the rigor and might and experience of the New York Times and they used it to help us confront a bully and protect women. They pushed us to gather as much evidence and documentation as possible. As Celine said, the real basis for our investigation, in addition to the women's voices, was to have the settlements, the memos, the internal company records, so that we could break the he said, she said cycle and give the brave women who came forward a mountain of evidence to stand on. That kind of evidence, that kind of written evidence, gives reporters and sources courage because there's proof that something happened. We also drew courage from tradition, from high standards and craft. We did this investigation using a set of time-honored rules, probably the same rules that you've studied here. We got as much material on the record as possible. Every woman's account that we used was thoroughly corroborated. We took the allegations to Harvey Weinstein. We gave him a chance to respond. What some people don't understand about those methodologies is how protective they are. Did they protect our sources? Of course. Did they protect our subject, Harvey Weinstein, from being accused of baseless or poorly supported allegations? I hope so. But those methods also protected us. They gave us confidence and certainty and resolve. We also got a lot of courage from our colleagues. Right before we investigated Harvey Weinstein, the Times did a very similar investigation that proved seminal and instructive to us as we did our work. Emily Steele and Mike Schmidt pioneered a new model of sexual harassment reporting. They were investigating Bill O'Reilly and they used settlements, which had always been used to silence allegations, to reveal them instead. 
The fact that we're now having a national debate about settlements, the morality of NDAs, paging President Trump, uh, and confidentiality agreements is due in no small part to their groundbreaking work. The moral horror of the Weinstein story is how someone could have racked up 40 years of allegations without anyone stopping him, with more and more people helping him along the way. Our colleagues Susan Dominus, Steve Eater, and Jim Rutenberg stood with us and helped us investigate and tell that story. Speaking of colleagues, my partner Megan Tui is very sorry she can't be here today. She sends her thanks and regrets. What that means for me is that I can say whatever I want about her. <laughs> and what I want to say is that it's a privilege and a joy and a source of courage to work with a partner like that, to go into an investigation like this with a partner whose intellects, instincts, work ethic, ethics, and integrity you trust so deeply gives you courage because you know that you are not alone, that you can make, we, we, the decisions we made together were sometimes big, but sometimes they were as small as the right way to word a text with a source. And we had the ability to stand there and spend 20 minutes composing a text with exactly the right words. That became a source of strength and reassurance for us both. In reporting the story, the two of us had a mantra that we shared with victims and that got us through our own hardest days. We said, we can't change what happened to you in the past, but the power of journalism is that we can help you take this pain and turn it to some constructive purpose. And maybe, just maybe, if we work together, we can help other people. We, of course, had no idea what the real results would be. We could never guarantee what would happen to our sources, but we could express our hope and our aspiration and our kind of common resolve that the reason we were all doing this was for some constructive purpose in society to, um, to move forward together into a better future. In the end, so many courageous women said yes to that proposition of ours, and our ultimate thanks is to them. A few weeks after our story was published, Megan and I were invited to this very fancy awards dinner with Ashley Judd. We went with her, and she got an award for being a named source in our story. That's literally what her award plaque said when we looked at it. It says, for being a named source. <laughs> so for journalists like us, getting an award like the McGill Medal is the honor of a lifetime. But seeing our sources get an award for telling the truth, that I think is the world that we all want to live in. So I want to end here today by saying that I believe that journalistic courage is, all, is ultimately collective. I don't want anyone in this room leaving today saying, oh, Jody Cantor, Megan Tui, they're these distant figures, they're not like me, I could never do what they did. I want you to feel that you absolutely can as soon as you find the right partners the right sources, the right peers, and the right story. Thank you so much for this incredible honor.